Sup guys and welcome to my updated Call of Duty Warzone Pacific Season 1 FPS guide. In today's video I'm going to show you how to get the absolutely best possible performance out of Call of Duty Warzone after its integration with Vanguard um, by going through each and every graphical setting in the game and talk about how each setting influences performance. So as always, I run a whole bunch of benchmarks on my two different systems that I have available here. Um, so you can see their specifications on screen right now. You can pause if you're interested in the details, but essentially I have my primary PC, which has an i9-9900K and is running on an RTX uh, 3070 at 1440p. And then I have a secondary computer uh, that is running an i7-7700K and the GTX 1060 and is only running at 1080p. Now for the impatient among you, who aren't really interested in how each individual setting affects performance, um, towards the end of the video I also provide a short overview over which options you have to enable or disable to get the highest possible, just the highest overall performance. Um, and then I also give you my personal um, preferences and recommendations on a more balanced profile, uh, which is actually also a significant lift in performance from putting all settings at low. Uh, so if you're interested in that, then simply use the chapters in the timeline to skip ahead. Also note that in today's video I'm only going to talk about how individual in-game settings affect performance. I'm not talking about NVIDIA control settings, I'm also not talking about Windows settings that might or might not have a measurable influence on performance. Uh, since I already made videos about these topics, you can find them linked in the description below if you're interested. And generally I haven't really found significant differences in performance when tweaking these settings outside of the game. So with having said that, let's jump right into the settings. Starting off with display mode, we have the option between windowed, full screen, full screen borderless and full screen extended window. On the right hand side, you can see a chart of the performance metrics that I got um, for these four different options. And for the first time, I'm also going to quickly go over how to read this chart. So the blue colors are for the primary system. Uh, so this is the more powerful gaming machine that I have and the orange or yellow colors are for my secondary or slightly weaker PC. For each system and option, I also provide two metrics. So the higher number is the average FPS that I get by benchmarking the game over seven different FOVs between 60 and 120. Um, and each of these settings I benchmark for eight seconds. And all of this taken together then gives me the average FPS shown uh, basically at the top of the graph. Additionally, I show the averaged 1% lows that I also get using the same approach, which if it goes down too much is a nice indication of stuttering in game. Now when looking at the results for display mode, we can see that we get the highest performance in full screen mode, uh, with full screen borderless not really trailing behind much, um, at least when considering my primary PC. The windowed mode decreases performance on my primary PC, but not really much on my secondary PC and full screen borderless extended essentially just covers the game over multiple monitors, which is why performance drops significantly on my primary PC, where I actually have two 1440p monitors connected, um, whereas it doesn't really affect performance on my secondary PC. Now many people argue that you get more mouse input lag in full screen borderless, so I would just stick to full screen whenever possible. Next I tested how much of an impact enabling Nvidia highlights has on the game and as you can see on the right hand side, there is almost no measurable impact by enabling NVIDIA highlights. And the same is true if you enable shadow play in order to record your gameplay. Me personally, I don't really use NVIDIA highlights, so I have this disabled. Moving on to NVIDIA reflex low latency is actually where I see my first big surprise when it comes to the performance numbers that I did for this video. Surprisingly, enabling the boost mode of NVIDIA Reflex Low Latency slightly decreases the performance both on my primary and secondary PC. This is surprising because this generally makes the GPU run at the maximum performance mode, which keeps GPU clocks at higher frequencies um, that should actually improve performance overall. But as you can see, and I actually tested this multiple times because I thought it was a bit of an outlier, if I only put this at enabled, I'm actually gaining a few FPS. Now, while I would always recommend to enable NVIDIA Reflex Low Latency because it reduces input lag, um, I'm not so sure if I would still recommend this to set this to enabled and boost. And I would actually be really interested in your guys' opinion and experience with not having this setting at enabled and boost, but rather putting it at enabled and uh, seeing if you actually also get high performance as I did in my benchmarks. 
Now, before moving on with the video, I would like to take a second to mention that most people who are watching my Warzone FPS guides are in fact not subscribed. As you can see from the analytics page of my last FPS guide, where I got almost 400,000 views, only 3.4% or 30,000 views of which actually came from subscribed users. Now, what makes me a little bit sad is that when I compare these numbers to other YouTubers, then I can see that they have between 20 or maybe even 40% of views on their videos that come from subscribed users. So if we could only get between 5 or 10% of people watching this video to also subscribe to the channel, then that would absolutely make my day and would make me so much more motivated to keep on producing these kinds of videos. Moving on to the quality tab, let's discuss the field of view. Now on Verdansk, I found that setting the fill of view to something between 90 and 100 actually provided higher performance than when using a field of view of 60 or 70. On Caldera, this doesn't really seem to hold true that much anymore. As you can see on graph, I do get actually a slight bit of an improvement in performance when going from 60 to 70, but then performance slowly and gradually decreases until I reach the lowest performance at 120 degrees. And therefore, if you kind of want the best of both worlds, so the highest possible performance and the highest possible field of view, then the gold spot is now around a field of view of 100. Personally, I prefer to have a little bit more, so I usually run the game at 110. Moving on to details and textures, we have the streaming quality. Now, simply increasing this from low to normal with all of the other options kept at the lowest possible values, um, I don't really get any difference in performance whatsoever. Now, because this option also has the effect of rendering the game at very, very low resolution, so both uh, geometry and the terrain uh, have this very ugly and plain color that's really not very pleasant to look at, I would always recommend to have streaming quality run at normal. Note that running streaming quality at normal has a larger performance penalty when increasing texture resolution compared to having this at low. Since we're already talking about texture resolution, here's a comparison between the different levels that you can set your texture resolution to. As you can see, there isn't really much of a difference between the low and normal options, and this also reflects nicely in the sort of very similar performance numbers that I get for these two options. Increasing texture resolution further to high actually does have quite a measurable and significant impact on performance, and I would only recommend to run the game at high if you maybe want to take some nice screenshots. Other than that, you probably just want to set this option to low or normal, depending how much VRAM you have in your GPU. Anisotropic filtering has a measurable impact on performance when increasing this option from low to both normal and high, uh, which was actually observed on both of my system quite nicely. And when I look at a comparison of the visuals in-game when increasing this option, then I really don't think that the performance penalty that this option introduces is worth the basically negligible improvements in visual fidelity. Next, we have particle quality, and this is actually quite an interesting option, it always has been, and one that I have always recommended to have enabled. And the reason for that is not that it improves performance, in fact it actually decreases performance by a significant margin, about 4 FPS on my primary PC and about 2.5 on my secondary PC. However, if you have this option set to low, then you have this kind of annoying shimmering of trees that are kind of sticking out into the uh, horizon, where in the background there is fog effect applied. But this is very jarring and very annoying, and I usually like to set particle quality to high in order to avoid having to look at these kind of shimmering graphics. Still, if you want to get the highest possible performance, um, regardless of your visual quality, then set particle quality to low. Bullet impacts and sprays does have a measurable impact on performance on both of my systems, which is actually something that I was relatively surprised to see. So unless you're interested in looking at the recall pattern of different guns, you probably want to leave this option disabled. Now for tessellation, I tried to give you a nice comparison of the different tessellation modes um, with rocks or different terrain and seeing how it actually changes the game, but frankly I really wasn't able to find any example where tessellation had a noticeable improvement in sort of the 3D-ness or bumpiness of the ground. 
However, enabling this option gives me a measurable decrease in performance on both of my systems, so don't even bother. Dismemberment and gore effect I did not benchmark because I wouldn't expect it to affect performance at all. On-demand texture streaming does not affect the game's performance at all. In fact, this is a very nice uh, way to see how consistent these tests actually are. When you look at the blue bars, you can see that the average FPS is essentially the same for all of these different options. However, I read that some people actually encounter stuttering when enabling this option, and because I don't see an improvement in the visual quality of the game anyways when enabling these options, I would recommend to keep this option disabled. Now let's move on to post-processing effects and let's talk about NVIDIA DLSS. Now, for those of you who don't know, DLSS essentially uses upscaling uh, using some clever AI techniques in order to make the game look as it would run at the native resolution, whereas the game actually runs at a much lower resolution, giving you therefore much higher performance. On the right hand side, you can see my performance metrics that I get from my primary PC, because only RTX 20 and 30 series graphics card support DLSS. Naturally, all of the different DLSS modes improve performance significantly. However, this improvement in performance also comes with a very significant decrease in the sharpness of the game. So here's a comparison of how each of the different DLSS modes look in-game when moving right and left. As you can see, the game looks much less sharp compared to having DLSS disabled, and you can see that there is this kind of ghosting or banding effect, especially behind birds or isolated objects in the sky, that makes the game look very jarring. The only preset that I could maybe recommend is Quality, which is the one you're seeing right now, uh, which makes the game almost as sharp as without having the LSS enabled, but at the same time you get sort of a bit of a anti-aliasing, so if you kind of want free anti-aliasing, then NVIDIA DLSS quality is probably the option for you. This nicely leads me to the next option, which is anti-aliasing. Now, any anti-aliasing mode will introduce a significant performance penalty in-game, and you can see a comparison of how the game looks with the different anti-aliasing modes yourself right now, um, but me personally, I don't really like to use anti-aliasing because of the very significant performance drop which each of the options, and also because the game simply becomes a bit less sharp and it seems to be much harder to see people. On the other hand, if you hate the dancing trees that you get when having AA disabled, then you probably have to bite the bullet and use SMA one times. Beyond that, I don't really think that the hefty 13 to 15 FPS performance penalty is worth the increased visual fidelity of the higher AA options. Now, for depth of field, I had to benchmark with the gun ADS, so this is why the baseline numbers are a bit different um, to the other baseline numbers. Uh, however, you can see that both my systems show a 3 to 2 FPS performance penalty when enabling depth of field, and because the OF kind of just introduces a lot of pixelation on screen, I would generally recommend to leave this disabled. World and Weapon Motion Blur I did not benchmark, they likely also have a slight performance penalty when enabled, but honestly I don't really know anyone who likes to have this enabled anyways. Finally, the Shadow and Lightning section contains some of the most important settings, especially if you want to get the highest possible performance. Starting with Shadow Map Resolution, we can lose up to 10 FPS by going to Extra, and when comparing the different options side by side, we can see that between Normal and Extra there really isn't much of a difference in my opinion, so if you want to get nicer shadows then use Normal, but generally I don't really spend my time looking at the shadows of a game, so I like to stick this at low to get the highest possible performance. Next we have two very important options in Cache Spot and Cache Sun Shadows. As you can see on the right hand side, on my primary system I gain 4 FPS by enabling Cache Spot Shadows and 2 FPS on my secondary PC, whereas enabling Cache Sun increases performance by a whopping 8 FPS or 3 in the case of my second system. Enabling these both options gives us the highest possible performance boost of 10 or 6 FPS on my primary and secondary PC respectively. Note that the 1% lows of the both case does sort of drop a bit, however it's still higher than when having cache disabled. So unless you only have 8GB of memory, which is anyways not enough to play this game, I would always recommend to have cache spot and cache sun shadows enabled. Next we have particle lightning, which to me has always been a bit of a weird option. 
Um, when you look at the performance metrics, you can see that with the ultra option, we do drop a bit of performance, nothing really earth shattering to be honest. And if I try to find differences in the quality of, for instance, a Semtex explosion, then I can't really tell the difference between ultra and low. So because there is really no gain in visual fidelity, just stick particle lightning to low. Ray tracing, interestingly, is possible even on my old GDX 1060. And you can see the performance penalty of enabling ray tracing on screen right now. So on both my systems, I get a 15 or 8 FPS performance penalty by enabling ray tracing. And honestly, this just isn't worth the slight improvement in visual fidelity. In fact, I haven't really been able to see much of the shadows improve by enabling DirectX ray tracing. Ambient occlusion, quite surprisingly, has a rather significant impact on performance in Call of Duty Warzone. And because all this really mostly does is making dark corners even darker, I would highly recommend to leave this disabled. Finally, here are the performance numbers when enabling screen space reflection. As you can see, I get about the same performance penalty with each of the different options, which in fact is noticeable enough that I would recommend to have this option disabled. And there you have it, those are all of the in-game options of Call of Duty Warzone benchmarked. However, I do have a last graph that shows you the performance that you can expect with two different presets, which are basically the presets that I would recommend anyone to either run. So the best balanced preset, which is a balance between the highest possible visual fidelity while still getting the highest possible performance. You can see actually slightly more than setting all of the options to low. Um, which is essentially running the game in the display mode full screen, render resolution 100, using NVIDIA highlights disabled, NVIDIA reflex low latency enabled, not enabled and boost, field of view at 100, streaming quality normal, texture resolution normal, anisotropic filtering low, particle quality high in order to remove the shimmering trees, bullet impacts and sprays disabled, tessellation disabled, Dismemberment and gore effect disabled, on demand test streaming disabled, under post processing effects everything undisabled except for filmic strength which should be at 1 if you have AA disabled. And finally under shadow and lightning, shadow map resolution low, enabling both the cache spot and sun shadows option, very important these two, having particle lightning at low, ray tracing disabled, ambient occlusion disabled, and finally also disabling SSR. So with these options I'm getting about 3 to 4 FPS more on my primary and secondary PC respectively. On the other hand, if you're interested in the overall absolutely best and highest possible performance that you can get in Call of Duty Warzone uh, without reducing the render resolution and without using DLSS, then use the display mode full screen, disable NVIDIA highlights, Use NVIDIA Reflex Low Latency only enabled, not plus boost. Setting the field of view under the quality tab to 100. Setting all the options under details and textures to low. All the options under post processing effects to low, except for filming strength, which should always be at 1 if you have anti aliasing disabled. And finally, having everything disabled or setting to the lowest possible setting under shadow and lightning, except for cache spot shadows and cache sun shadows. Those options give me almost 10 FPS on my primary PC and about 7 FPS on my secondary computer. So if you want to be in absolute sweat, then definitely use these settings. And that is it for my updated Call of Duty Warzone FPS guide. Now I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. It took me so many hours to actually gather all of the different benchmarks together. Uh, so I would really appreciate it if you guys could hit that like button and consider subscribing if you want to see more videos like this. But with that, all I'm left is to wish you a happy new year, have a wonderful day, and I'll see you guys in the next video. And that's two teams. And the roof. That's one. That's one on the roof. Guy here down. Uh, one below here somewhere. Yeah. Easy games, boys.